All right, hi everyone. Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Tickmill, uh, where we'll be <clears throat> uh, going through having the live trading session today. I right, just want to make sure uh, all of you can see my screen. Uh, you should be looking at the uh, the opening slide, uh, which indicates a live trading session. And just want to make sure you guys can hear me loud and clear as well. Do take note, we've got the uh, chat box open as well. So do do not hesitate to drop any questions uh, at any point during this uh, webinar. All right, let me see. Right, okay. Um, right, all right. All right, thanks, Paul. Great. All right, okay, we're good to go then. All right, okay, let's, uh, let's just start things off. Okay, as usual, uh, please take note uh, that the material that's provided here is uh, purely for information purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Right? The views, information, or opinions expressed in the text belong solely to the author and not to the author's employer, organization, committee, or other group or individual or company. And of course, also do take note of the high risk warning that comes with trading CFDs. They're complex instruments and come with a high risk of losing money rapidly due to leverage. All right, okay. Uh, so, okay, my name is Ketan Ramachandra. Uh, I'm an analyst here at Everest Fortune Group. So this webinar series is brought to you in a special partnership between Tickmill and Everest Fortune Group, where we have been the finalists for best FX and equity research for the following years, 2019, 2020, and 2021. All right, okay. Uh, so before we dive into the charts and trading view, we'll just uh, take a look at some of the key economic events that are coming up this week, right? This could potentially uh, drive certain currencies <clears throat> Uh, over the course of the week, right? Okay, so there's quite a, it's quite a, actually, it's quite a heavy calendar this week. Sorry, apologies. <clears throat> it's quite a heavy calendar this week. We've got various data from uh, various countries and continents coming up this week. Uh, we've got inflation data out of New Zealand. We've also got the October's RBA meeting minutes coming up. We've got uh, labor data from the UK, Canadian inflation data, US retail sales, UK, uh, inflation data, Australia uh, employment report, and UK retail sales as well. These are just some of the uh, key highlights or key economic events that are coming up this week. So in general, uh, inflation has been picking up across most developed economies after retreating for most parts of uh, the last 10 to 12 months. So a hotter CPI reading on 16th October Right, this could potentially uh, function as a bullish catalyst for the Kiwi. Now, similarly, we'll have the RBA meeting minutes uh, being released, which will give us further insights into the decision-making process uh, by the RBA and their outlook on monetary policy, as well as the economic conditions. So uh, if this uh, minutes turn out to be neutral, uh, then it could act as a bearish catalyst for the Aussie dollar. Otherwise, if the tone of the minutes are hawkish, then of course this would potentially act as a bullish catalyst for the Aussie dollar. We also have UK labour data coming up. So a robust and employment figures would show that uh, the labour market is still strong in the UK and uh, it's quite likely that, that that would cause the Bank of England to at least uh, maintain rates elevated, right? They may not increase the cash rate again, but it's quite likely they would hold it higher for longer should the labor market continue to show resilience. Then, of course, we also have Canadian inflation data coming up. That's also increased or rather accelerated on an annualized basis over the past uh, two months. So another uh, hot reading could potentially provide boost for the Canadian dollar. That means dollar cat could likely to fall, could could fall uh, on this date as well. Then we have UK, uh, US retail sales, UK CPI. Similarly, inflation in the UK as well remains elevated. Another hot reading could provide another boost for the pound. And you have Australia's uh, labor force report or the employment report and UK retail sales. All right, okay, so with that, uh, let's just quickly take a look at Forex Factory. Okay, no, let's just dive straight into the charts. All right. Okay, so do take note that um uh, you can view, you can go to Forex Factory and view the economic calendar where you can get the exact date and time of the release of each of these individual um uh, economic data points. But these are not the only ones. I've just highlighted about uh 
the more important ones to watch out for this week. But there's also a few more others uh, that, have, that have been lined up, right? So it's quite a heavy uh, calendar for this week. All right, okay, so with that, let's go into the charts. Okay, so I'm on um, the daily time frame for the dollar index, right? So as you've seen, since uh, mid-July, the dollar index has been in a strong bullish uptrend. And if you look actually on a weekly uh, time frame, okay, not including this week, but the past 13 weeks, we have seen 12 strong weeks of gains for the dollar index out of 13. So since uh, 17th of July till last week, there have been 13 weeks out of which we've seen 12 weeks of strong gains for uh, the dollar index. So this has been due to a combination of uh, inflationary pressures increasing in the US, uh, as well as uh, demand for safe haven assets such as the US dollar over the past 10 days or so driven uh, primarily by the geopolitical tensions and risk in uh, the Middle East, right? Specifically in Israel coming up uh, with a conflict ongoing there, right? So we've had various uh, fundamental data and uh, catalysts as well to spur this uh, strong bullish trend for the dollar index, right? Okay, so with that, we'll now switch back to the daily uh, time frame and then we'll try and analyze the dollar index uh, or identify the key support and resistance levels for the dollar index on a daily time frame, and then we'll zoom in onto the four hour time frame. All right. Okay. So, as we can see, of course, price making the swing high here on 3rd of October, right? We can see price making, uh, where's my oh, brush? Here we go. So, you can see price making pretty significant swing high here last week which is also another level where price ran into a little bit of resistance as well uh, at the end of November of 2022, right? So we can see uh, a couple of instances where price has run into resistance around uh, 107.15, right? So that's how we're going to identify the first resistance level for uh, the US dollar or the dollar index on the daily time frame, right? So what we're looking for is strong overlap or pullback levels where price has run into resistance. But similarly here, if you look at <clears throat> on 21st of November, price running into resistance around 107.83. And if you go back towards uh, August, as far back as August and September of 2022, we see price finding support around this level as well. So this level here at 107.97 does look like a pretty significant overlap support, uh, overlap level, which could function as the next resistance level for the dollar index. Right, okay, so <clears throat> just to recap, uh, first resistance is at 107.19, second resistance is 107.99, uh, right? As I've mentioned by the significance of the overlap levels as well. Right, to the support side, uh, we can also use a Fibonacci retracement to identify uh, some of the support levels, right? So we'll start the retracement from this swing low here on 14th of July, going up to the swing high here on 3rd of October, right? So we can see quite nicely where the 23.6% Fibonacci retracement level lies. We see price running into resistance at about 105.50 back on mid back in mid September 14 September and then you can argue on 29 September it found support just above this level before proceeding to make that high in October and then once again it found strong support <clears throat> last week as well so we see a very strong case for a significant overlap level here and if I go back to uh, March of this year, we see dollar index making a very significant swing high resistance as well. So this level was previously acting as a resistance before price broke above it, which now is going to potentially act as a major support level for the dollar index. So that's how we've identified uh, the first support level for dollar index. So that's what we're going to do here. And I can actually, I can probably just extend it as far back as here as well. Since so January, price running into resistance here and then getting rejected. So you can see a couple, we have two instances, 6th Jan as well as on 8th of March, where the dollar index ran into resistance and retreated away from this level. So this acted as a strong pullback resistance level in the past, but once price broke above it, 
uh, is now going to function as a strong pull, uh, overlap support now, right? We see resistance here, here, and of course here on 15 September, and then support on a couple of occasions, 29 September and 11 and 12th of October. Right, so that's how we've identified the first support level uh, for the dollar index, which also aligns very well with the 23.6% Fibonacci retracement. All right, okay, then moving on um, to, to the second support, right? Okay, we can see price making another significant swing high here uh, back in early June. And you can see that price ran into resistance at this level, which is at about 104.38, right? Running into resistance here at the end of August before eventually breaking higher. And once it broke above it, it found support here on 11 and 12th of September. So you can see multiple instances where price has reacted off this level, right? And this level here, this, this overlap level here also lines up very well or aligns very well with the 38.2% Fibonacci retracement, right? So that's how we've identified the second support level for the dollar index. Right, okay. Uh, with that, then we'll just tidy up the chart. As you can see, 23 and 38 are the retracement levels that uh, that we shall use for now. So let's just keep 23 and 38. Right. And if you can just zoom in a little bit. Okay. Right, so these are uh, the significant resistance and support levels uh, to look out for for the dollar index on the daily time frame. All right, let's quickly zoom in onto the four hour time frame and see where the other uh, more, perhaps more actionable levels could lie. All right, I think as of now, uh, as of now, right, probably, all right, we see this level here. Right, okay, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so this is a bit more clearer. Right, okay, we do see this level at 106.24, potentially uh, functioning as an uh, intermediate support level for the dollar index. Why do I say that? Because uh, we see price running into resistance here, a little bit of resistance here on 10th of October. And after that, once price broke above it, <clears throat> it did find support above this level on Friday the 13th before bouncing higher. So should price... Uh, continue to pull back. Now, in this morning in general, we can see, or well, rather today, uh, the dollar index gap lower, right? On Friday, or the, rather, yeah, yeah, on Friday, it closed at about, uh, what is this, 106.70, right? right? And then it opened, it gap lower to open at about 106.55, uh, roughly, and but it's proceeded to uh, retreat for most parts of today, right? So should the dollar index continue to, to slide lower, Potentially, it could find a little bit of support around this intermediate uh, support level, which we identified as an overlap support. Let's see if there's any Fibonacci retracements that uh, perhaps line up with this level. All right, we can see that the 38% uh, retracement level <clears throat> aligns just above where I had identified the in intermediate support level. Okay, so for on the four-hour time frame, um, I would also identify this uh, swing high that took place on Friday the 13th as an intermediate resistance level, right, for the dollar index, right? I think with regards to the uh, first resistance, second resistance, and first support, and second support, I think that's fine. The levels that we've identified on the daily time frame, uh, it's, uh, it's still pretty fine for the four-hour time frame, but we just add in the intermediate resistance and support levels uh, intermediate support at 106.24 and intermediate resistance at 106.78 right, to identify uh, more actionable levels that uh, <clears throat> with regards to where price is currently trading. All right. Okay. So with that, um, we'll uh, move on to the euro. Right. Similarly, right, if you look on the daily time frame as expected, Right, with uh since mid July, of course, with the dollar index gaining uh significant strength over time. So obviously, naturally, the euro is going to be falling over this period as well, which is what we are seeing on the charts here. Right, okay. So 
right? I think uh, first of all, we can perhaps try and identify if there's a bearish channel, right? We can see price trending lower over the last 13 weeks. Let's see if there is indeed a, perhaps a bearish channel for uh, the euro. I think this, yeah, it's quite likely. Yes, we do see a very strong case for a bearish channel, of course. Right, we can see a couple of times where price has tested the upper trend line of this channel as well as the lower trend line. Right, so we can see clearly price has been respecting this bearish channel for the better part of uh, the last 12 or 13 weeks. Right, okay, so now that we've identified the bearish channel on the daily time frame for the euro, let's try and identify some of uh, uh, the support levels as well. Right, we can see. Uh, last week, or not last week, uh, about two weeks ago, on 3rd and 4th of October, the euro finding support around 1.0460, right? We can see that this level here does seem to be a pretty significant support level uh, with price bounce uh, finding support here on 6th of December of last year, as well as running into a little bit of resistance in mid-November and end of November as well, right? So what was previously resistance, then... Uh, uh, switched into a support level, which then again uh, functioned as a support again back on the uh, 3rd and 4th of October. Right, So I think for the first support level for the euro would be around uh, 1.0463. So that's how we've identified the first support level for the euro. Right. With regards to the second support level on the daily time frame uh, we do see price making a <clears throat> small pullback here right finding a little bit of support here on 29th of november last year and then uh, bouncing higher so this level 1.0319 would be how we would uh, identify the second support level okay right now let's look to the upside um we are the major levels as well, all right? Okay, well, naturally, when you see price pushing against the upper trend line of the bearish channel, right, this should indicate to us that this is potentially a resistance level as well, which is at about 1.0640. And if you slide across here, we can see price <coughs> finding support around this level on 14th of September. And of course, price making a very significant swing bounce here or at the end of May as well, right? We can see price making here a very significant swing bounce. So this was previously acting already as a very strong support level uh, for the euro, right? Uh, and then which it did offer support again on uh, in mid-September, price retraced a little higher before eventually uh, falling below it. But then again, but then after that, it functioned as a resistance level, right? You can see how this level at 1.0635 originally functioned as a pullback support here or a swing low resistance, swing low support here at the start of June, and then offered a little bit of support as well in mid-September before price finally gave way. And then it functioned as an overlap resistance level on 12th of October. So that's how we've identified the first resistance level for the euro. All right, what about the second uh, resistance level? Right, I think we can use uh, Fibonacci retracement as well. Right, we can, we'll start this retracement from the swing high here on 18th of July down to the swing low here on 4th of October. We can see that the trend line is capturing the price structure, the market structure very well. So when that happens, that usually indicates that you've drawn the Fibonacci retracement with the right starting and ending points. All right, so let's pull up all the fibs to see what we get. Uh, where is it? Oh, here we go, right. Okay, so we can also see uh, the 23.6% Fibonacci retracement level aligned very well with the overlap resistance at 1.0635. That gives us, uh, that acts as a supporting factor to the significance of this level. We also see another decent overlap here uh, on 25th of August, price bouncing off 1.0770 on 25th of August, and then finding resistance on 12th and 13th of uh, September as well. Right, so we see a pretty decent overlap level here. So I think we can use that to help us identify the second resistance at 1.0765, which also aligns with the 38.2% Fibonacci retracement. Right, so that's the second resistance. 
Okay, so let's just tidy up uh, the fibs. We'll keep 23 and 38. Right, let's see. I think perhaps we can also use a Fibonacci extension here. Okay, when we're trying to extension, Fibonacci extension levels, levels are simply <clears throat> levels that are greater than 100%. We still use the Fibonacci retracement tool. Right, so in this case, we'll start from this swing low here on 31st of May, going up to the swing high on 18 July. The key extension levels are at 127 and 161%. Extension levels usually in this scenario would help us identify potential support areas. So what we're looking for is a market structure or price structure that looks like an inverse Nike tick, right? So we can see here, in general, price has made uh, a pattern that resembles an inverse Nike tick, right? We all know Nike ticks, this, uh, the logo to be like this, right? This is a Nike tick scenario here. But in this price structure, we see an inverse of it. And that's when you can apply the Fibonacci extension levels to help us identify potential support areas, right? So we can see that not only uh, is the first support at 1.0463 identified as a significant overlap uh, support level, it also aligns very well with the 137% Fibonacci extension level, right? And not only, yeah, okay. And uh, if you look at where the 161% Fibonacci extension uh, level lies, it also lines up very well with this pullback support here as well. So should, so should uh, price continue to slide lower for the euro, right? If it breaks through the first support and then also the second support, where we can expect it to find a uh, significant support would perhaps be at where the 161% Fibonacci extension level lies, which also lines up very well with this uh, swing bounce here that took place on 21st of November last year. As we see price making a pretty decent swing bounce here on 21st of November. All right. So these are the levels for the euro on the daily time frame. All right, let's zoom in onto the four hour time frame to see <clears throat> if there are any other uh, levels that we can identify to where price is currently trading. All right, okay, we can use a Fibonacci retracement here starting from this swing high on uh, 12th of October, going down to the swing low on 13th of October. All right, let's pull up all the fibs. All right, we can see that uh, where price has made the small pullback resistance on Friday, the 13 lines up uh, quite well with the 38.2% Fibonacci retracement. So probably on the four hour time frame, we can identify this level here at 1.0550 as an intermediate resistance as well. So let's keep 38.2%. And um, we'll add in the intermediate resistance level here, which is at 1.0558, right? Okay, so <clears throat> we have an intermediate support, uh, resistance level at 1.0588. I think for the first support, it's fine. Uh, I guess you can also argue here, right? Price making a strong pullback here on 6th of October. <clears throat> price making a strong pullback on 6th of October. And it found support again on 13th of October as well. So this does look like a pretty decent support level as well. So we'll highlight these levels as intermediate uh, support and resistance levels for the euro on the four hour time frame. And of course the uh, resistance and support levels that were identified on the daily time frame are applicable as well. All right, so do take note, this is what we are seeing for uh, the euro, right? So although the dollar index has been sliding lower for most parts of today, it does seem to have found support around 106 uh 40 for now so let's see if it if it continues to climb higher or fall but uh it does look like the dollar is pulling back for now and we could potentially see the resumption uh then, then naturally that would cause uh, the euro to climb higher so do take note this would be a pretty uh significant resistance zone for the euro where we see uh the intermediate resistance and of course the area that's bounded underneath the upper trend line of the bearish channel. So 
this uh, zone here between 105.60 to about 105.80 would probably be a potential resistance zone should price continue to rise higher. So we could see the euro retrace higher today before eventually uh, reversing course to resume the downturn. All right, okay, so that's uh, the euro. <clears throat> Okay, let's go on to the pound. I right, just want to uh, let you guys know, so if you have any uh, requests for any analysis on uh, any of the commodities or crosses or uh, the FX majors, do let me know early so we can, uh, we, we actually have time to go through uh, the analysis together, right? Let's not wait till the end of the session for all your requests to come in because uh, then simply we will not have time to go through it properly. All right, great. Okay, great to see everyone responding. Yes, for sure. We'll look at gold as well and oil, definitely. All right, great. Excellent. All right, okay. Uh, we still have time, so tell you what. I'll, we'll, we'll cover pound, and then after pound, we'll, we'll go into uh, gold and oil as well. All right, okay, great. So similarly, right, if you look on the daily time frame for the pound as well, we do see the market structure very similar to the euro, of course, with dollar index rising so strongly over the last <coughs> 12 months, uh, 12 weeks. Right, okay. So, uh, right, okay, let's see if there is a bullish trend uh, channel here. Obviously, on the upside, we can see price pushing against this descending trend line. And I guess you can sort of argue that there is a sort of a, bearish channel as well right with price uh pushing against the upper trend, trend line and the lower trend line of the bearish channel several times right and okay of course just like it's similar to price action to the euro right we see a pretty strong support level at 1.0667 which also aligns quite well with this pullback that took place on 15th of march so i think the first support level is pretty easy to identify for the pound on the daily time frame Right, I think we can just use 1.2056 as the first support level. Right, <clears throat> similarly for the second support level, we can see uh, this swing low that took place on 6th and 7th of March. Right, that's what we'll use to identify the uh, second support level. Right, we can see price making a very significant swing bounce here on 8th of March. Right, okay, similarly to the upside. We do see price running into resistance here. This is what we call a pullback resistance on 11th and 12th of October. And if you look across, we see it lines up very well with this swing low that took place in middle of May as well, right? 25th or towards the end of May, 25th, 26th May, price making a very strong, significant uh, bounce off this level, right? So we have a very significant overlap level here, right? This level previously, this level at 1.2321, acted as a very strong pullback support level or swing low support level here. Uh, it didn't offer any support as all, at all on 22nd of, uh, yeah, 21st of September as price came crashing down, but it did function as a resistance uh, last week. So this is why we have a strong overlap level here. This signifies, which, uh, this signifies as a first resistance for the pound at 1.2321. Of course, just like how we drew the Fibonacci retracement for the euro, we can also draw the Fibonacci retracement from this swing high here, 14th of July, going down to the swing low on the 4th of October. Right, let's pull up all the fibs just to see where they line up. All right, so we can see the 23.6% retracement level line up very well with the overlap resistance that we had identified as well. So this uh, functions as a contributing factor to the significance of this level. So we'll keep 23. Uh, we do see 38 and 50 as well, uh, lined up quite well. We can see uh, <clears throat> price finding a bit of pullback support here uh, in early September at about 1.2460, which also lines up quite well with the 38.2% Fibonacci retracement. So that's where I would identify this uh, second resistance level for the pound. And if you look a little bit higher up, we can see there's a very nice overlap level here as well. You can see price making, once again, another significant uh, bounce here. So creating a significant swing low here at around 1.2590, uh, which also aligns very well with the 50% Fibonacci retracement. And similarly, we see price making another bounce here, but although a smaller one, right? So we do see multiple, a couple of times where price has bounced off this level 
uh, which should indicate that this could potentially function as a resistance level in the future should the pound uh, approach 1.26. All right. Okay. Uh, so let's just tidy up the retracement levels. We'll keep 23 and 38 for now. All right. Great. Okay. Next, uh, let's just quickly go into the four hour time frame to see if there's anything else we can identify. Uh, I think first resistance, first support is fine. It's not very far from where price is currently trading. If anything, I would probably just uh, highlight this pullback resistance level here at 38.2%. Right, as an intermediate uh, resistance level for price. Right, so 1.2213 is a level that I want to identify as an intermediate resistance for the pound on the four hour time frame. As we see, it making a pretty decent pullback resistance here, and it also aligns well with the 38.2% Fibonacci retracement. All right, okay, with that, let's go on to gold. And then uh, we'll look at uh, oil as well. All right. So <clears throat> just, okay. <clears throat> so of course, we'll start with the daily uh, time frame. Right. So as we can see in general, right, I'm sure uh, most of you will be aware that uh, the US dollar and gold prices have an inverse relationship or negative correlation. So what that means is if the value of the US dollar is going up, gold prices are generally falling. And naturally, if gold uh, the value of the US dollar is dropping, this usually acts as a bullish catalyst for gold prices, right? So since uh, mid-July, we can see uh, a very strong rise in the value of the dollar index. So generally, this should uh, typically translate to lower gold prices over the same period. But as you can see, since mid-July is here, we do see that trend playing out, right? So when dollar index was going higher, uh, gold prices have been falling. But since uh, 9th of October, right, exactly last week, we're actually seeing gold prices and the dollar index uh, trade pretty much in tandem, right? A little bit in tandem. So that negative correlation has broken down. So we're actually seeing a little bit of positive correlation between the value of the US dollar and gold prices. Now, this is primarily caused by uh, demand or flows into safe haven assets, right? So as we all know, the uh, ongoing uh, geopolitical risk and conflicts and tensions going on uh, in the Middle East have created a strong demand for safe haven assets. So what are the safe haven assets? Typically, they are the US dollar, gold, of course, and also to a certain extent, currencies such as the Japanese yen and the Swiss franc. Well, let's just stick to uh, the dollar index and gold prices for now. So that is why we are seeing a little bit of positive correlation between uh, the value of the US dollar and gold prices for now, as the demand for safe of these for the demand for these safe haven assets have picked up quite significantly over the last uh, five or six trading days. Right. Okay. So with that said, uh, let's quickly do the analysis for. Goal. Okay, so once again, we're on the daily time frame, uh, perhaps, right, we can see here, even before doing any Fibonacci retracement, we can already identify a very strong support level for gold prices, which is about 1810, right? So we see price making a very significant swing here, uh, finding strong support here on 2nd of March, uh, yeah, sorry, end of February, right, making very, uh, finding strong support here making a double bottom before making a significant bounce higher, right? So we can already see a strong double bottom support here at uh, roughly about 18.12. And similarly, this level then again acted as a strong support level for gold for the third time. So naturally, this is a very strong support level for gold. All right, but that's it. Uh, <clears throat> let's place the support level here. Right, I think because this is trading pretty far from uh, where price is uh, currently, this level sits pretty far from where price is currently trading. So I would like to identify this as the second support now. So the second support, which is a major pullback support level for gold is at 80.10. Right, what about uh, <clears throat> the first support level, right? If you look here, 
back in uh, 29th of June as well as on 21st of August. Once again, we see price making a significant swing bounce here right on 29th of June and also another significant swing bounce here on 21st of August, right? So this level here between uh, 1906 and 1887 does did offer a strong support zone in the past. Naturally, that got broken here uh, towards the end of September. So potentially, this level here could act as a support level again, right? It may not be as significant as uh, what it offered the first two times because price broke through this original support level quite easily, right? We see this level here breaking through with uh, gold prices smashing through this level pretty easily on 27th of September, right? So this somewhat, this move here somewhat diminishes the significance of this uh, originally strong pullback level, but since there's no other level to reference, uh, it's quite likely that this could function uh, as the first support level for gold, which is at 1893. So let's just uh, label this as the first support level. And also, uh, rather than an absolute level, I'll just highlight it as a zone. Of course, as you can see, uh, the bottom, the wicks, the lower end of the wicks falling as low as 1883, right? So I like to highlight this as a zone rather than an absolute level. All right, great. Okay, uh, okay let's tidy up this as well. Right. <clears throat> so in terms of resistance, <coughs> we can also see uh, price making a pretty... Uh, Okay. All right. Hi, uh, Johanan. I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Why not 1916? 1916. All right. Okay. That's where price is currently trading, right? Okay. Uh, perhaps that level could be something uh, more applicable on the four-hour time frame. So we'll look at that once we zoom in. But for now, on the daily time frame, these are the more significant levels that I can identify for now. Okay. How long will this correlation break last? All right. There's a question by Jaden as well. To be honest, I don't really know. Uh, it really depends on market sentiment. Right now, the sentiment is on the uh, on the side of uh, caution, right? With geopolitical risks uh, remaining elevated, so demand for safe haven assets could could continue to stay high for most parts of this week. If we do see the conflict de uh, de escalate, then that's when we can clearly see the positive correlation breakdown and then we should see uh, the negative correlation resume right so it's quite difficult to tell when it's actually going to uh, revert back to normal uh, negative correlation but we'll we'll see for now but yeah as of now it does seem that <coughs> the dollar index right has been pulling back today as we speak uh, not as much as gold prices but yeah the positive correlation does seem uh, to remain for now. All right, okay. Uh, okay, if we look at resistance, we see price making a significant swing high resistance here. All right, okay, Johan. Uh, I think maybe I'll get to see, some, okay, maybe I see I see what you're pointing out. And maybe this is something that we can identify on the four hour time frame. So just give me a little bit of time. Uh, while we identify the first resistance and second resistance on the daily time frame, and then we'll zoom it into the four hour time frame where we're quite likely to find uh, more, uh, find other levels that are closer to where price is currently trading, right? Okay, so we do see price making a swing high resistance here, 31st of August, another swing high resistance here, 20th of September. So this level here or this zone here around. 1,000, uh, 1930 all the way to about 1950 does look like a pretty significant resistance zone for gold, right? So in terms of first resistance, uh, we can probably set this level here, right? And as I mentioned, probably identified it as a zone rather than an absolute uh, resistance level. Right. And similarly, the second uh, uh, resistance level for gold prices would be the swing high here that took place on 19th of July, which is about 1978. Right. Um, what else is there? Can we see? Okay. Is it worth drawing a Fibonacci retracement here? 
okay, it may not be the best retracement. And as we see uh, <clears throat> the trend line, all right, it's sort of right in the middle of a price is trading, right? We started this resist uh, retracement from this swing high here on 4th of May down to the swing low 6th of October. Probably not the best, but let's see what we get, right? Just... Right, okay, so we do see 50% Fibonacci retracement level lined up quite close to where the first resistance is and 61. Okay, I think you can still keep 50 and 61. To help us uh, to add as uh, uh, secondary factors, uh, contributing factors to the significance of these levels. Okay, right. With price pulling back now, we can also do a Fibonacci retracement from this swing low here, 6th of October, going up to the swing high, 13th of October. Let's pull up all the fibs. We can also see the 38.2% lined up quite well with where the first support was originally uh, identified. So we'll keep 38.2% here as well. All right, okay. So this is, these are the levels, <clears throat> key support and resistance levels for gold on a daily time frame. Right, let's move on to the four hour time frame and see and identify any other levels, right? Okay, let's see. Since we have this here, Okay, let's add in the 23 as well. Maybe, perhaps, we can use 23 and 38. All right, okay, on the four-hour time frame, actually, I would use this level here at 1904 rather than 1916. Right, why is that the case? Because we can see price making a pretty significant bounce here uh, back on 25th of August. And, of course, another significant bounce here back on 14th of September. Right, And this level here right, forms a nice pullback level. 1903 or 1904, which lines up very well with the 23.6% Fibonacci retracement. So instead of 1916, I would actually uh, probably more, I'm more inclined to use uh, 1903 as a pullback support. So in this case, I would highlight this as an intermediate <clears throat> support level for price. I can see yeah, I can see why you would also use 1915, right? I think I think you could also I can also see why you would use 1916 here. It is also a pretty decent uh let's zoom in a little bit here, right? It is also a pretty decent overlap, right? We can see um okay, let me just get rid of this annotations. We can also see like price uh <clears throat> bouncing off this level, retracing just a little bit higher, and then once price broke underneath it finding a little bit of resistance, and then, of course, making this, uh, finding strong support here as well. All right, so I do see a case as well of why you could potentially use 1915, 1916, but because price has broken through this level quite strongly here today, so that is why, at least for me, I'm more inclined to use uh, 1903 as, uh, the, as a more uh, closer support level for gold, all right? So let's just tidy this up. Yeah, I know I can see the reason, I can see the uh, reason or justification for trying to, uh, for using 1915 as well. But I think just because of this price action here, right, we've seen price break through quite easily. Again, for the second time, right? The first time it happened was here, 26th of September, and we do see it again. Uh, yeah, for me, at least I would use it I would use 1903 together with the 23.6% Fibonacci retracement. All right. Uh, is there anything else perhaps that we can try and identify? Right. Uh, remember we, we were talking about Fibonacci extension levels, right? Uh, in this case, we do see a potential case for a Nike tick movement or Nike tick price structure here, right? We can see price uh, forming a swing high here on 21st of September, coming down as low... Uh, coming down to this swing low here on 6th of October and has proceeded to bounce quite strongly uh, until uh, this morning, right? Or until today. So if price does uh, bounce off or stays above 1900, we could see it push higher. And let's see if that, uh, if any of the extension levels, right? Remember we identified 127 and 161 as key extension levels, whether they line up with any of the 
whether if they line up with the second resistance or close to the second resistance. All right, so let's do that. Right, okay, so we'll start this retracement from this swing high here, 21st of September, down to the swing low on 6th of October. <clears throat> We will use the 127 and 161. Remember, these are extension levels. Extension levels uh, in this scenario or with this type of market structure are going to help us identify potential resistance levels. Remember previously for the pound, we use the extension levels to help us identify um, support levels. But in this case, where you have a market structure that could potentially resemble a Nike tick, then we are going to use the extension levels to help us identify uh, resistance areas. Right, so as you can see, 161 is simply too high. We'll just keep 127. Right, so we can see that we have a case of a, a Fibonacci confluence. Okay, so what do we mean by Fibonacci confluence? So that means, uh, that just simply means there's more than one Fibonacci level at that particular price point or that particular price zone. It could be a case of two Fibonacci retracements or a retracement and a projection like what we have in this case. So we have a 61.8% Fibonacci retracement as well as a 127% Fibonacci extension. Right? It's, they don't align very well with each other, but you can see that there is a potential for uh, <clears throat> a zone, a relatively strong resistance zone between which is bounded by the Fibonacci retracement and the Fibonacci extension level. And we can also see the second resistance there on the daily time frame at 1978. Right, okay. So this is, um, these are the levels uh, for, for gold. And of course, with price making the swing high here, I would actually uh, use 1932 as an intermediate resistance level as well. All right, okay. Oh, sorry, there's a couple of questions. All right, how do I find the USD X symbols and MT4? All right, okay. Uh, all right, Emmanuel, I think uh, for this, um, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, you just uh, type DXY, it should be under, uh, it's quite likely that the instrument is going to be uh, tracking a futures uh, contract, right? So it should be a DXY under MT4, right? Okay. Uh, I, oh, sorry, if I can, if, sorry if I don't pronounce your name correctly. Okay, could could Wando miss last week's webinar? First, was it all right? Okay, yeah. For Tech Mill, do head on over to their YouTube uh page, right, where all past webinars will be uploaded. So you'll uh definitely see uh the white cost strategy, the webinar for the white cost strategy being uploaded. Should be it should be already uploaded onto. Tick Mill's YouTube page. If not, it should be uploaded very shortly. And of course, with today's live trading session as well, uh, it will be uploaded in due time as well. All right. Okay. Uh... Right. Okay. So, right. <clears throat> okay. So these are the levels that you should uh, take note of for, for goal on the four hour time frame. All right, okay. Uh then we had oil, right? Okay, so let's quickly move on to oil. Right, okay. Once again, with geopolitical tensions in the Middle East, uh, this could impact crude prices as well because there's fear of disruption to production uh capabilities, there's fear of uh logistics as well, shipping oil in and out of that region. Uh potentially you could have a situation where so far, no uh, critical oil infrastructure uh, sites have been hit. So, so <clears throat> that means production is still, uh, production capabilities are still uh, up and running. Uh, what is not so clear yet, perhaps is maybe the shipping lanes around that region. Hopefully for now, it still uh, stays open, but we do see after oil surge last gap opened last week, right? WTI oil gapped about 3% uh, last week on Monday. We can clearly see that this gap has been closed, right? If we look on the daily time frame. Yep, you can see that this gap, <clears throat> this gap was clearly closed on uh, 12th of October. And it's proceeded to bounce higher uh, towards, on especially on Friday, right? I think crude prices in general gained well over 5% on Friday. 
Okay. Uh... I just want to. I see. All right, okay, because for US all right, it depends on whether you're buying a standard lot or a micro lot, right? So if you're buying a standard lot, one pip, or in this case, one cent uh, is usually uh, 10 US dollars, right? So if you see price <clears throat> going from uh, 36 to 37, uh, for a standard lot, this should usually indicate one pip or one point rather, one point would indicate uh, $10 if it's a standard lot. If it's a micro lot, then one point would indicate $1. All right, so that's what it be. So it really depends on which type of contract, right? Are you, are you using a standard contract or standard lot size or using a micro lot, right? So typically for oil, one point for a standard lot would equate to 10 US dollars. And if you're on the micro lot, uh, is it mini, mini at first? Yeah, if it's on the mini, sorry, if it's on mini, one point would equal to one US dollar. All right, okay. So, uh, right, okay. So, okay, we have the daily time frame for oil, right? So we can see since um, end of June, oil prices have had a strong rally up. Uh, most For most parts of this run, this was primarily caused by uh, or led by Saudi Arabia and OPEC and OPEC Plus uh, extending the production cuts. So when you have major players, uh, major production players extending production cuts, that means there's potentially less supply coming into the market with demand being relatively stable. This could... Uh, push oil prices higher, which is what we saw for most parts of July all the way till end of September. <clears throat> okay, so that's what has uh, primarily led the rise of uh, crude prices. Uh, basically, it was uh, OPEC uh, led by Saudi Arabia uh, extending the production cuts. It was also peak summer travel during the US as well, where generally we have higher demand for crude prices or for gasoline. Of course, so if you need more gasoline with people traveling around peak summer period, uh, naturally you need crude oil as well, right? So that is uh, why we've seen this relatively strong uh, bullish trend uh, in WTI oil up till 28th of September, right? Okay, so with that, we can use a Fibonacci retracement, right? We'll start this retracement from this swing low here on uh, 28th of June. Going up to the swing high here, 20th of September. Let's pull up all the fibs. Right. Okay. So, okay, even before doing that, I think, uh, let's zoom on a little bit. I think the second resistance for oil on a daily time frame, I think it's pretty clear. You can see price uh, running into resistance several times at around $92.60. So, we see price making a very significant swing high here. Uh, at on 10th, 11th of, of October last year, another significant swing high here in early November as well. And this is where price uh, <clears throat> got uh, ran into resistance once more. As right? so you can see in the past where 9260 has acted as a strong pullback or multi-swing high resistance, it does continue to function as a major or significant resistance level once more. Right, And because of the week here, we could probably, I uh, would like to identify the second resistance as a zone rather than an absolute level. All right. Okay. Now with that, um, we can also see um, this level here where the 23, okay, 23.6% 23 is no longer valid. Why is that the case? Because when price breaks through uh, a retracement level like this at 23 and 38.7, these levels are no longer valid. So that naturally we can't use them, right? So we'll get rid of that but we do see 50 percent and 61 they are going to be more useful to us in identifying the support level so let's keep 50 and 61 <coughs> right but uh to identify the first resistance um i can see a somewhat pretty decent overlap here right price running into resistance at uh 87.50 uh on 6 and 7 september and then we can argue it found a little bit of support around this level or just above this level on 21st of September, 26th of September, and again on 3rd of October, right? So we do see a case for a pretty decent overlap level here, which is what I would like to identify as the first resistance for WTI, WTI on the daily time frame. Now for the second, uh, first support, right? We do see price making a pretty significant swing here. 
Uh, let me see if there's any other levels. And we do see price making, finding strong support here, which aligns close to where the 50% Fibonacci retracement level is. So this is what I would, uh, where I would identify the first support for uh, <clears throat> WTI oil. Similarly, for the second support, we do see a nice overlap level that aligns close to where the 61.8% Fibonacci retracement level lies, right? We see price making, running into a little bit of resistance here on 14th of July. Then once price broke above it, finding strong support here on 23rd of August before bouncing higher. Right, so we see do see a case for a very significant overlap level at 77.38, which aligns very well with the 61.8% Fibonacci retracement. All right, so these are the <coughs> major support and resistance levels for WTI oil. All right, on a daily time frame. All right, so let's uh, go into the four hour time frame and see if there are any other levels that we can identify. All right, okay. All right, I also see, I guess, a case for an intermediate support around this level here. Why is that the case? Okay. Um, we see price running into resistance here, failing to break above uh, 86 or 85.50, right, uh, last week. And then today, as of now, it's finding, uh, it's managed to find support above this level, it's managed to remain above this level. So we do see a pretty decent overlap level. And if I were to stretch it <clears throat> as far back as uh, over here, right, we can see that this overlap is pretty significant as well. Price running into a little bit of resistance here in early September and finding double support on 6 September as well as on 8 September, and then uh, running into resistance here uh, last week, and then potentially support here. So on the four hour time frame, I would identify uh, 8571 as the intermediate support uh, for WTI oil. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> right. Hi, uh, Webster. Yeah, okay. I see why you can call it as, as a zone as well, right? Because you see the bottom of the wicks here. Right, you see the bottom of the wicks. And also because we have the 50% Fibonacci retracement level. Yeah, you're absolutely, you're, <clears throat> you're absolutely right that this should be a zone rather than an absolute level as well because of where the 50% Fibonacci retracement level lies and also because where the bottom of the wicks here extend to, right? So that's, yeah, you're absolutely right with that. We can identify this as a zone rather than an absolute uh, level. Okay, uh, what else? Let's see. Can we use a Fibonacci retracement here? <clears throat> okay, hi, Paul. Okay, by zone, we mean the right. When we say absolute level, like you see this green line here, the first support, Right, this first support level is just says 81.06. So this is what we mean by an absolute level. When we highlight a, uh, a zone, we can see where the shaded green box is. So this level here is between 1852, where the 50% Fibonacci retracement level lies, going up to where the first le uh, support level is. So it's between 1852 and 8106. So that's what we mean by a zone. Right, that's why, and for the zones, we will uh, usually highlight it as a, a shaded box. So, in this case, because it's a support, we're going to use a green shaded box, and if it's resistance here, yeah, we're going to use a red shaded box. So, that's what we mean by zone. All right, okay, let's see, let's pull up all the FIPS for this retracement. Anything worthwhile? Yeah, again, okay, you can see. Right, the twenty three point six percent Fibonacci retracement level lies right. Let me zoom in a little bit. You can see that this retracement level lies quite close to where the overlap support is. So we do see uh, a supporting case for this zone as a pretty decent support level or support zone. Sorry, right? Okay. Uh, anything else? <coughs> Right on the first on the four hour time frame, this first resistance doesn't look very great, right? We can see here on the daily time frame it looks a lot better, but on the four hour time frame we can see that this doesn't look 
as clean, the level isn't as clean. Okay, but I think we can also use a Fibonacci retracement starting from this swing high here down to the swing low, 6th of October. Let's see all the fibs. All right, we can see <clears throat> the 50. Okay, we do have the 50 here and the 61 here as well. Let's just keep 50 for now. All right, just like to highlight that on the daily time frame, uh, this level here, the first resistance at 87.51 does look much uh, better. And it's not so clear on the first, uh, on the four hour time frame, but because I would use the daily time frame to take precedence over the four hour time frame. And also we have the 50% Fibonacci retracement level lining up quite well with 87.51. So that's why I'll keep the first resistance at 87.51. All right, okay, we've come towards the end of uh, <clears throat> today's webinar. All right, so um, just before we end, I'd just like to launch a poll as well. Really appreciate it if you guys can give your feedback as well. Uh, and of course, for all past webinars, do head on over to Tick Mill's YouTube page where all the past recordings will be up. If they're not up, they will be uh, uploaded in due time by this week, at some point this week. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in today. Uh, do take note that it's a pretty heavy economic calendar this week. So you could have potentially have a lot of uh, data that could trigger certain moves for currency markets and uh, indices. Oh, sorry, currency markets and commodities as well. Right. They could act as a potential bullish or bearish catalyst for uh, for dollar index, for pound, the euro, and so on and so forth. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. With that, all right. Thanks everyone for tuning in today. Hope this has been great. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I'll catch you. Do look out for all upcoming uh, webinars by Tickmill and do not forget to register. And yeah, have a great trading week and I'll catch you in the next webinar. All right. Thanks everyone. Take care. And uh, best of luck in your trading journey for this week.